Everybody say in the press. Amen. And for a subtitle, press in. Somebody say press in. What I looked at the definition of the word press, it was defined as something that moves or causes to move with friction, force, to, to contact something with pressure. When we think about the world, the world has a way of causing undue pressure upon us. And if we are not careful, we will allow the world and the pressure that we feel from the world to cloud our judgment. If we're not careful, the pressures that we experience in the world will cause us to do things that are not godly, to do things that are unholy, and to do things that are just plain sin or against God's will. When we think about the pressure of life, many of us sometimes allow ourselves to succumb to the pressures of life. But I declare today in the name of Jesus, no longer. When the world begins to pressure us, we need to fight back. We need to begin to pressure the world. Don't allow the world's pressure to cause you undo and, uh, and uh, cause you to do things that are not like God. Instead, and, and, and some of us just take, we'll just roll over and just allow the world to do whatever the world wants to do. But instead of allowing, instead of uh, uh, rolling over and allowing the world to do what the world wants to do, we need to roll up our sleeves, take a stand, and say enough is enough. How many of you have ever been tired of taking what the world dishes out? The world is about things and sometimes we just take it, we just take it, we just take it. I'm tired of taking what the world is out. Yeah. I want to roll up my sleeves and I want to say enough is enough. When are Christians going to stand up and begin to apply God's word over our lives and tell the world that you can't come any further? I'm drawing a line in the sand. You cannot trade what God has for me. What God has for me is for me and you can't have it. You can't take it. You can't steal it, and if you try, I'm going to fight you for it. Many of us will just sit back, will cower down, will allow the world to do whatever the world wants to do. But today, we can take a stand and fight. Allow the Satan to know that, uh, you know, Satan will come into our territory. He has no problems coming into our territory. But when are we going to take the fight to him? We need to invest in his territory and take back everything that the devil has stolen. We need to go back to, to press. Now this word press, it means that you cannot consider the status quo to be where you live. The status quo cannot be where you live. But we need to be to the point where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we decide now that we're going to make a change. Nothing will happen until we decide that we want to make a change. So if whatever you're going to now Whatever your malady is, whatever your sickness is, whatever your disease is, whatever you are looking to God to, 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 to fix, it won't be changed until you make up your mind, until I make up my mind, until we decide that we want change. It's not going to change until we decide that we want change. The Word of God says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy except for unto God, pleasing to the original service. But that verse 2 says, uh, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if you want some change, you're going to have to decide in your mind that you want to make a change. If you want to lose weight, you're not going to lose weight until you decide. I've had enough of being fat, I've had enough of being overweight, I'm going to lose some weight. If you want to uh, increase your finances, it's not going to happen if you keep spending money. You have to decide, I'm going to cut it off, I'm going to save my money, I'm going to first of all start paying my tithes, and I know I'll be blessed. And then God will bless everything else. Nothing changes until we change our minds. We need to have a made up mind to go in a different direction. The press, we have to press again. The word of God says, when we talk about this press, many times when life brings challenges to us, we do not want to press and dig in. If there's something 
that's going on in our lives and we want change, we got to press in. Yeah. What does it mean to press in? It means to get off the status quo and do something different. If we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. But if we decide to make a change and allow the Holy Spirit to help us to make that change, then we can begin to walk in a new direction. But we got to begin to press in. Press in, press in symbolizes commitment. It symbolizes dedication. It symbolizes that I'm going to have to do some things that I haven't done before. You know, the, the definition of insanity is to keep on doing the same thing you've always done and expect different results. If we want different results, we're going to have to do things differently. Amen. We got to press in. Press in to the end. It's not going to come easy, but we have to spend some time pressing. And as it relates to God, what does it mean to press? It means that instead of watching TV, give me a word. It means instead of going to the movies, uh, get on your knees and start praying. You got to press in. If you want some change, you got to press. Do something different. As we look at this text, from the Gospel of Mark, it's, it's, it's critical that we understand some of the theology behind this writing. Now, Mark is a fast-paced book. It's the shortest gospel. I mean, you that. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel. And scholars have said that Matthew, Luke, and John have all kind of taken some of their uh, thought and theology from the book of Mark because it's the shortest. And the others are long, so they, they took some things and they added to it. So Mark is the shortest gospel. One of the great things about Mark is that things happen immediately. There yeah. is fast pace, it's fast moving. This is the dear talking Sunday school this morning. If you want some fast paced reading, if you want to be kept on the edge of your seat, read the book of Mark because it's fast moving. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's important because we need to know as we begin to press in, as we begin to dig in, as we begin to seek more of God and more of His revelation. We need to understand that God can move immediately. God can move quickly and quick. He can move sooner than right now. And I come to encourage somebody right now who might be riding in the storm. You may be in a storm, but I want to let you know that God is able to deliver you from your storm immediately. Now, he may not always choose to operate that way, but even if he doesn't, it's good to know that he's able. He's able to deliver us from our storms immediately. And even if he doesn't, he will ride with you while you're in your storm. And he'll give you peace in the midst of your journey. God is good. In the press, we're going to press in. That's what we're going to press in. So that as, we, as we delve into this, uh, I want to draw your attention so we make sure we get it in context. I draw your attention to the fourth chapter of Mark, around verse 35. We find a very familiar passage of scripture when Jesus had just finished ministering uh, to the crowd. There were multitudes that came to hear Jesus speak. And uh, he told his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Remember, he said, let's go over to the other side. It's critical that we remember that Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. So they were in the boat, and they began to go into the waters. And midway of the water, it was nighttime, the king stood. The winds just began to blow. And the winds were blowing the waves, the water so bad that the waves began to get into the boat. Now, it's one thing, it's good to have your boat in the water. It's another thing to have the water in your boat. You don't want to have the water in your boat because that means you don't sink. Yeah. So the disciples were all panicking, they were fearful, they were afraid, and they went to Jesus, looked at him, and then Jordan was sleeping on the pillow. The storm was blowing, the storm was raging, and Jesus was sleeping on the pillow. That lets us know that when storms come, don't always be in such a hurry. Don't always be so anxious and so uh, so upset and so uh, frazzled that you lose your, your, your common sense. Don't allow storms to take control. You take control of your storm. So they woke Jesus up. They said, Jesus, Master, don't you care that we're going to perish? Don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus got up and woke the sleep out of his eyes and said, Peace. Be still. And the disciples were amazed. And Jesus said to them, 
Where is your faith? Now, why did he say that? I'm glad you asked the question. He asked them, where is your faith? Because what he was saying was, you didn't have to wake me up. Where is your faith then? You could have done the same thing that I did. I spoke to the storm and it ceased. Jesus wanted them to know that they had the power to do what he did because they'd be operating in his name. I want to put a pin there. Many of us need to begin to operate in faith. We need to begin to operate in faith. Sometimes when life has its way with us, the first thing we do is we run to our girlfriends, to our friends, we run to the soothsayers, we go to our barber, sorry, Red Pants, we go to uh, the bartender, we go to our girlfriend. We need to go to Jesus. We need to go to Jesus. And we begin to press in, we need to know who to go to. We need to go to Jesus. Many of us, when, when trials come, the first thing we do is we run away from God. Oh, I don't want people to know my business. Uh, I got to get away. I don't want uh, others to know what I'm going through. Uh, oh, some of them may think, well, God can't help me anyway. But we need to know when a storm is coming. When you're in the midst of a storm, you need to run to God, not away from Him. Amen. As we approach the fifth chapter of the book of Mark, it opens up with the storm being over. And he spoke peace of the storm. They went on to their journey. And they got to the land of uh, the Gadarene. Uh, they got to the land of the Gadarenes. They got to the land of the Gadarenes. And when they got to the land of the Gadarenes, guess who met Jesus? There was this crazy man. Now y'all gonna be advice crazy. Well, if you live in the cemetery and you ran up and down the hill screaming and cutting yourself, you crazy. If you live in the cemetery, you crazy. So Jesus met this crazy man. And this man, long story short, he heals him. And uh, the people come by and they're wondering, how did this man receive his healing? Now this story may seem to be unrelated to what we just talked about, but what God showed me is that sometimes physical storms prepare you for the spiritual storm that's coming. Physical storms will prepare you for spiritual storms. Because when we go through physical storms, we're going to be paid. You got health issues, uh, marital problems, uh, disease in your body, whatever your physical story is. When we become so disgruntled with what we're going through, we begin to seek God. And we should do that all the time. But if we're honest, many of us won't seek God unless something tragic happens. Many of us don't seek God until problems come. When things are going good, oh, yeah, thank you, Jesus, that's fine. But if we're honest, many of us don't press into God unless something's going wrong. I want, us, I want all of us, especially me, to grow to the point where whether something is good going on or something bad going on, we're still pressing into God. We should always be seeking Him, not just when things are bad. So the story teaches us that physical storms will prepare us for the spiritual storm that's coming. So after, the, after Jesus healed this guy, the, the demons, they all jumped out, went into the pigs, and went to the ocean and drowned themselves. They got back in the boat, and they went back to uh, across the sea. Now see, this is, this is good reading. This is, this is like one chapter. This is like, so all this is happening in one chapter in the Gospel of Mark. <coughs> so they went back, and then when Jesus got back, there was a crowd of people following him, a crowd of people. And there was this ruler from the synagogue See, this is, all this is going on. These people around the whole crowd of people that are following him. And this guy from the synagogue comes in and says, Jesus, Jesus, my daughter's about to die. Can you come? And Jesus, okay, I'll go, I'll go. And he's around all these people. Keep in mind, he's in the midst of all these people. As he is on his way, and this guy's name, by the way, is Jairus. He's going to go heal Jairus' daughter. So as he's on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, even this is woman. This woman comes up and touches his arm. Now there, there's more to it. Uh, the Bible says that she had went to all the doctors. She had went to all the practitioners. She had went to all of the uh, Kaisers and uh, all the insurance places. And nobody helped her. She had this issue of blood. And for the women, I know the men can't understand this, but all the women in the house, if you know what I'm talking about, this issue of blood, she was on her cycle. And it wasn't like it happened every month, once a month. Constant. 
for two years. Now, I know I got some witnesses in the house of the ladies. When it happens once a month, you can and you talk about the hormones and all that other stuff y'all go through. You 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 wonder, you know, you can't wait until it gets over. But can you imagine going through your cycle for 12 years? I'm trying to paint the picture. I'm trying to paint the picture. So she was she was on the cycle and she had this issue of blood. But she declared to herself, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just get to Jesus. Wow. Before I get ahead of myself, I was in that state. If we want to be able to press back when life presses us, there are three pressure points that our text outlines that we must consider. So if we want to be able to press back when the world presses us, there's three points. Uh, pressure points that we must consider. Okay, so this lady who who uh, is going to be our example for this morning, if we want the same results she got, then we're going to have to do the same things that she did. Can I get an amen? amen? If we want the same results that this woman received, we're going to have to do some of the same things that this woman did. Point number one. She perceived connectivity. She perceived connectivity. If you look at uh, that verse, part, portion of that verse from the King James, it says, when she had heard of Jesus, when she had heard of Jesus, she perceived connectivity. So when she had heard of Jesus, no doubt this woman uh, had heard of all the miraculous things that Jesus had done. She heard of it all the healings. And so she, she uh, perceived in her mind, she thought, about connectivity. If I can just get connected with Jesus, if I can just get connected with him, I know that he can heal me. So she perceived connectivity. And God wants us to know that he wants to be connected to us. He wants us to be connected to him. The, the, the word of God says that he is the vine and we are the branches. If we are not connected to him, then we are not going to be able to be fruitful. We're not going to bear any fruit. So we will be connected to him. Jesus wants connectivity. He wants us to be connected to him. So she perceived connectivity. She thought to herself, if I can just be connected to him, I know that everything's going to be all right. Pressure point number two. She pushed continually. Somebody say push continually. The second portion of the scripture says she came to the press behind. So not only did she perceive uh, connectivity, but she pushed continually. She came in the press behind. Now we have stated that there were so many people around. Now traditions would have us know that if you were unclean, any woman who was on her cycle, they were, they were considered unclean. They were not to be out in public, and they were to remain away from the general population. But this woman did not allow what other people thought about her to cause her to lose her blessing. This woman didn't care about what other people thought, didn't care about what other people uh, are going to say about me, but I want my blessing. So she pushed. She pushed her way to Jesus. She pushed. She pushed uh, continually. She didn't stop, but she continually pushed herself to Jesus. You can imagine all these people. But now let's back up just a little bit. This woman had suffered the issue of blood for 12 years. She's tired. She's weak. She's hurting. And on top of that, she's embarrassed because she's got this issue that won't stop. So the Bible is not that explicit, but you can just use your imagination. If you've got an issue of blood that won't stop, then you can imagine your garments are all bloody, your garments are all smelling, but she didn't let her garments being bloody or her garments being smelling stop her from pushing through the crowd. We need to get to the point where we allow nothing to stop us from getting to Jesus. We shouldn't let anything 